الحمد للہ وسلاۃ وسلام الرسول اللہ علی وصاب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اقرا بسم رب کل لذی خلق خلق الانسان من الق اقرا و رب کل اکرم اللہ علم بالکلم علم الانسان معلم یعلم ربش علی صدری ویسلی عمری وحل العدت من لسان یف کہ حکولی مائی رسپیکٹ ریلڈرز اینڈ مائی ریلڈرز اینڈ سسٹرز آئی ویلکم آل آف یو ود اسلام گریٹنگز السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. It's a pleasure for me to be once again back to London, especially Harrow, after a span of eight months. The topic of this evening's talk is seeking knowledge in the light of Islam. Your children are an amana. Give them the best education for both the worlds. It is a long topic, but it's basically dealing with seeking knowledge in the light of Islam. And that your children are an amana, so give them the best education for both the worlds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the glorious Quran, the first guidance that he gave to the whole of humankind, it was not to pray, it was not to fast, it was not to perform hajj. But the first guidance given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran to the whole of humankind was ikhra. It was to read. It was to recite. It was to proclaim. And I start my talk by quoting a few verses from the Quran, from Surah Ikhra, chapter number 96, verse number 1 to 5, where Allah says, Ikhra bismi rabbika allazi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Ikhra wa rabbuka al-akram. Allazi alama bil kalam. Which means, read, recite, and proclaim in the name of thy Lord who has created. Who has created the human beings from something which clings, a leech like substance. Read, the Lord is most bountiful. He who has taught the use of pen has taught men that which he knew not. Though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the first guidance in the glorious Quran that we should read. But unfortunately, we realize that the Muslims, in the Muslim community, everyone does not read. And those Muslims who are involved in acquiring knowledge, in reading, they don't read as per the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah does not say only read. Allah says, Ikra bismi rabbika allazi khalaq. Read in the name of thy Lord. So when we read, when we acquire knowledge, we should acquire knowledge in such a way that we come closer to our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the knowledge does not bring you closer towards your Creator, towards your Rabb, then that knowledge is not useful for the Akhirah. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, it's a Sahih Hadith, which is mentioned in Ibn Majah, Hadith number 224. Our beloved Prophet said, Talibul ilmi, seeking knowledge, Faridatun ala kulli Muslim, is obligatory on every Muslim. Seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim, man or woman. It's compulsory that every Muslim should acquire knowledge. And it is the duty of us Muslims to see to it that we acquire knowledge Many of us, we think that knowledge is only what we study in schools, in colleges, and universities. Education and knowledge starts at home. And the best teacher is the mother. It is the duty of the parents to see to it that they properly educate the children. See to it that they give them proper education. Because the child, when he or she is born, they are not responsible for the environment in which they are born. It is the duty of the parents to see to it that irrespective of the environment, they give them proper education. And today we find that there are various societies and the various ways of life in these societies. We have the Islamic way of life. We have the Western way of life. 
and we have a variety of different ways of life. As far as Islam is concerned, Islam is a complete way of life. It caters both to the spiritual aspect of the soul as well as the physical aspect of the body. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3, On this day have I completed your religion for you and have completed my favor for you and have chosen for you Islam. So once Islam is completed, nothing new can be added or subtracted from it. Our deen is complete. So as far as the way of life is concerned, Islam is a complete way of life. When we mix Islam with the other societies and other ways of life and other cultures, whichever culture we are living in, if that part of the culture is not against the Islamic Sharia, is not against the Quran and the Sai Hadith, we do not mind following or agreeing with that culture. But if that culture, if that society goes against Quran and Sai Hadith, we should not follow it. Islam is number one. And now we find that many a times while upbringing our children, we have a problem because of the differences in societies and cultures. And we are aware of the Western society, as many of the Muslims, they are living in Western society. And we find that though the Western society, it is advanced in science and technology, but as far as moral values are concerned, they are declining. We find in the Western society that alcoholism is on the increase, drug addiction is on the increase, obscenity is on the increase, adultery is on the increase, rape is on the increase, crime is on the increase. While educating our children, we should see to it that we give them a proper Islamic education. And while we train them and upbring them in a Western society or any society in the world, it may be an Eastern society also, we should see to it that we should make them a good Muslim. That is, one who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word film, which means to submit your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And any person who acquires peace by submitting his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is called as a Muslim. While educating our children, we should see to it that we should not get so much impressed by the Western society. We should only take the correct values from the society. We don't want our children to become alcoholics, to become drug addicts, to become adulterers, to become rapists. We want them to be good Muslims who submit the will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said that every child he is born in Dinul Fitr. Dinul Fitr means the innate religion. Every child is born as a Muslim. He submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, the elders, the parents, the teachers, they influence the child. He may remain on the straight path or he may become a fire worshipper, he may become an idol worshipper, and then he may go outside the fold of Islam. But every child initially, irrespective whether he's born in a Hindu family, whether he's born in a Christian family, a Jewish family, or a Muslim family, he is born as a Muslim. He submits civil to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Later on, by the influence of other people, parents, teachers, elders, he may go on the wrong track. That's the reason. Whenever any non-Muslim, he accepts Islam, the more appropriate and correct word is revert. He was on the straight path, he went on the wrong track, and then he came back on the straight path, on the straight track. So the correct word is revert. And we have got proof and evidence that every child is born in Deen al-Fitr. There were researches done on two tribes, the Kapauku tribe and the Australian Aborigin tribe. These two tribes did not come in contact with modern civilization till as late as 1950. 
And later on, when researchers went and tried to find out what was the way of life, it was everything of Islam but a name. They did not call themselves Muslims, but they believed in one God. They believed that God did not have any idols or images. They believed he was not begotten. When they worshipped the God, they did the sujood. They prostrated. They were following the basics of Islam, but they didn't call themselves Muslims. So if we let a child after he's born, if we do not influence him with any of the teachings, that child will grow up to be a Muslim. That is the deen al-fitr, innate religion. It is the duty of the parents that once the child is born, they should see to it that they give that child a proper environment to live and to continue life. It is the duty of the parents that they should see to it that they give proper education to the children. And many of us, we are worried about the education of our children. I would like to ask a question that when is the time you should start thinking about educating your child? What is the right time? Can anyone give the answer that which is the right time? When do you start thinking what you want to make your child or what you want to make him? What should he be in life? Which is the right time? Which is the right time? Right from the beginning. As soon as he understands. Sorry? When he starts to think to get a child. He may start thinking after 10 years. Which is the right time? Seven years old, two years old, when he can understand, when he's born. One year old. One year old. Fine, here we have different options. Here someone is saying three years old. Three years old. Someone is saying three years old, someone is saying two years old, someone is saying one year old, someone is saying when he's born. Islamically, the time to think of educating a child, the latest you should think, latest, huh? maximum, is when you choose your life partner. When you choose your life partner is the time you have to think about educating a child because the parents are the best teachers, especially the mother. That's the time if you want to make your child Islamic, you should see to it that you have a spouse who is Islamic. If you don't have Islamic spouse, how would you expect your child to be Islamic? So depending upon how you want to upbring your child is the time you start thinking when you choose a life partner. That does not mean already those who are married should choose a new life partner. <laughs> Some people ask me, now I'm already married, what should I do? <laughs> it is better late than never. You can start molding your life partner into that style. No problem. You can do dawa with the life partner. So you should realize that the best time to start thinking about educating your child, the latest is when you choose a life partner. As I was saying, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, it's a Sahih Hadith, which is mentioned in Ibn Majah, Hadith number 224, our beloved Prophet said, Talibul ilmi, seeking knowledge. Faridatun ala kulli Muslim is obligatory on every Muslim. Seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim, man or woman. Now, when we give knowledge to our children, we have to see to it that we give them proper knowledge. Knowledge can be broadly divided into two types. One is the basic knowledge of Islam. And second, knowledge what is required by the community. It is the duty of every parent that he should educate the children with the proper Islamic knowledge. Number one, most important is Tawheed, that believing in one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should not associate partners with anyone to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should not be associated with anyone else. Tawheed, number one. Then all the pillars which most of us know, but we should impart it in the right way to our children about salah, about zakat, about hajj, about fasting. It's very important. And, but natural, knowledge of the Quran. This Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. 
Yesterday in Bradford, I had a talk on Al Quran, should it be read with understanding? And I told them that the best gift that a parent can give to the child is the Quran and make the child understand the Quran. Most of us Muslims, we teach our children to read Arabic. They can read Arabic, but they can't understand. If we teach them the language of the Quran, the Arabic as a language, that is the best gift you can give. And inshallah, towards the end of my talk, I will deal and discuss with that in detail. The second type of knowledge is the knowledge required by the community. Knowledge which makes a person a doctor, makes a person an engineer, a lawyer, a scientist, an agriculturist. This is too required for the betterment of the community, for the betterment of the society. But when we are acquiring the second type of knowledge, we should see to it that when we acquire scientific knowledge, when we learn about mathematics, geography, history, this knowledge should get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, should not take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If this knowledge takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that knowledge is not correct knowledge. It's not correct education. It should bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, when we learn medicine, we learn how to save the lives of thousands of human beings. But in that same medical knowledge, when we learn how to do abortion, there are youngsters who are doing zina, and then they want to abort. So using this knowledge for activities which are wrong, we should abstain from that. Abortion for saving the life of the mother. If she has a health problem, Islam gives permission. Otherwise, Allah says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 31, and Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 151, that kill not your children for want of sustenance. Killing of children is prohibited. So whatever knowledge you acquire, it should be for the betterment of humanity and get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever moral values you are learning, we should see to it that when we put our children in the school, that school should upbring our children properly. Imagine if we put our children in the convent school, many of whose values don't match with the value of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is like we are tying the hands and legs of our children and putting them in water and asking them to swim. How will they swim? So when we put them in a school, see to it you put them in a proper school. If the culture and society and the school teaches you manners, it should be good Islamic manners. Nowadays we find that in the Western culture, they say that manners is building old age homes. Islam has got no place for old age homes. Because Islam believes that we should love and respect our parents. And there are several verses in the Quran. Surah Luqman chapter 31 verse number 15. Surah an Kabut chapter number 29 verse number 8. Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 151. Several verses we say that we have enjoined on the human beings that to be kind and good to your parents. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, verb number 8, in the book of Adab, chapter number 2, hadith number 2, there's a person who approached the Prophet and he asked him that who deserves the maximum love and companionship in the world? So the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that who? The Prophet again repeated your mother. The man asked after that who? Again, the Prophet said for the third time, your mother. The man asked after that too. Then the Prophet said, your father. 75%, three-fourths of the love and companionship goes to the mother. 25%, one-fourth goes to the father. In short, mother gets the gold medal. She gets the silver medal as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. <laughs> so Islam teaches that we have to love our parents. And especially as far as companionship is concerned, the mother gets three times more. So in Islam, there is no place for old age homes. So whatever manners and etiquettes that we teach our children, it should be in line with what our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. And we find today that Muslims are in the firing line. We find that Muslims have become backward as far as science technology is concerned, 
as far as education is concerned. And the main reason is because we have gone away from the Quran and Sunnah. Previously, from the 8th to the 12th century, it was called as the Dark Ages. Dark for whom? Dark for the Europeans. The amount of advances the Muslim Arabs made, it is phenomenal. And if we read history, what we read in school, I myself have passed from a convent school, a Christian missionary school. I've got my education from there. It's later on, afterwards I realize that what I read in school and in my medical college, I being a medical doctor, many things is something different. We are taught in school that the blood circulation was first discovered by William Harvey. In fact, if you read the Quran, Quran speaks about the blood circulation. In Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 66, how does the food enter into the stomach? Then from there, it goes into the intestine. From the intestine, why the bloodstream to various organs of the body, including the mammary glands, which are responsible for the production of milk. It speaks about the production of milk and about the blood circulation in a nutshell in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 66. After I did research, I came to know that the first human being who first described the blood circulation was Ibn Nafis, 600 years after the Quran was revealed and 400 years before William Harvey. But when we read in our textbook, we are told about William Harvey. How many of us know about Ibn Nafis? How many of us? Hardly anyone knows that Ibn Nafis was the first person who described the blood circulation. We learn about geography, but the person who drew the first world map of geography was Ali Drusi in 1154. What we study, the digits in school, you know what's it's called? It is called as Arabic numerals. The one, two, three, four that we use for writing. One, two, three, four. It is called as Arabic numerals. The other is a Roman numeral. The Indians were the people who first discovered about the zero, and the Arabs took it from there and made it famous to the world by adding a decimal. That's how we have the system today. We learn in mathematics about the Pythagoras theorem that the square of the hypotenuse in a triangle is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides. The Pythagoras theorem that we learn in school, it was first discovered by Al-Tusi. So we know that Muslims, few centuries back, they were advanced in science and technology. But when we read in our textbook today, they are hardly mentioned. Who is the father of trigonometry? It is Al-Biruni. Have you heard of Al-Khindi? Al-Khindi wrote 200 works in mathematics, in geometry, in logic. And at a time when Galileo, Descartes, and Newton, when they said that all physical laws are absolute, he said that it was relative. Later on, Albert Einstein did more research, and he propounded the theory of relativity. When we read history, we come to know that Muhammad, Ahmad, and Hassan Shakir, these brothers, they measured the surface area of the earth by measuring the angle at the Red Sea at a time when people thought the world was flat. We learn chemistry and we are told that Geber is the person who discovered alcohol. It is Jabir ibn Hayyan, Jabir. When they write in our textbook, it's Geber, Geber, sounds like a westerner, Geber. It is Jabir ibn Hayyan. So when we read, we think oh, it's a westerner, Geber, Geber. And Jabir ibn Hayyan, he discovered alcohol, and the word alcohol comes from the Arabic word al-gul, meaning evil spirit. When we history, we come to know about Muhammad Zakaria Arazi. He was advanced in the field of medicine, and he even wrote books on measles and smallpox. When we read medicine, we know that Ali ibn Abbas, he wrote 20 volumes on practice and theory of medicine. We are told about Avicenna, Avicenna, the Aristotle of the East. It is Ali ibn Sina. Ali ibn Sina, he was called as the Aristotle of the East. He was a philosopher, he was a mathematician. So when we go back to history and we see that we Muslims, we were on top of the world. The reason we were on top of the world at that time is because at that time we were close to the Quran and Sunnah. Now, we have gone away from Quran and Sunnah 
and that's the reason we are in the firing line. We should see to it that we upbring our children close to the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. It is a duty that we give our children proper education. That is the reason, I say, that your children are your amana. See to it, you give them proper education for both the worlds. And this was a dilemma that I faced maybe eight years back. And though, alhamdulillah, I used to give talks on education. And I did take time to choose my life partner because I wanted the right life partner. And finally, Allah gave me, alhamdulillah. And when the children were born, my eldest son is 12 years old. And I always had that thing that we should have a proper school which has a striking balance between the Islamic education and the formal education. I don't call mathematics science as secular education because secular by definition means nothing to do with God. I believe science believes in God. Mathematics is Islamic subject. So therefore, when I talk about the other conventional subjects, I call them formal education. Mathematics, science, history, geography, English. We call it as formal subjects. So I always had that dream that to have a school which has the striking balance between the Islamic subjects, Islamic education, and the formal education. Because mathematics, science, history, according to me, are part of Islam. And that made me tour the world. And I did a survey, alhamdulillah, of most of the Islamic schools at that time. That was about six to eight years back. In a span of two, three years, mashallah, I went to most of the best schools of the world. In America, in Canada, in UK, in South Africa, in Australia, in Malaysia. And I visited hundreds of schools. And when I observed that in the Western countries, most of the Islamic schools, almost all, they were more of a Muslim managed school. Muslim managed school means the management was Muslim, but I would not call them as Islamic schools. Because we realize that in the Western world, there is a fear of alcoholism, of drug addiction, of obscenity. So in these schools, we found that the dress code that the students wore, they were Islamic hijab, mashallah. They had a time for prayer, for salah, alhamdulillah. There was no alcohol, there was no drug, alhamdulillah. So that was what was called the Islamic school. Where back in India, most of the Muslim many schools, they have the Islamic dress code, you can offer salah, there's no alcohol, there's no drug. So I did not find something new. But alhamdulillah, considering the Western country, where drug addiction is common, alcoholism is common, obscenity is common, it is an achievement which I was happy. But what I came to search for, that when our children go to school, they should get the best of knowledge, I could not find any of the schools. What we wanted that we have now the Muslim Ummah, rather divided into two types of education. One type of education, when we have secular education, they acquire the so-called secular education, which I call a formal education. They acquire knowledge of mathematics, science, history, geography, but they are far away from the deen. On the other hand, when we go to our madrasas, we teach about Quran, Hadith, Sharia, Fiqh. Alhamdulillah, may Allah give them reward. But they are unaware of mathematics, science, history, geography. So we wanted a balance between the two. To have the best of both. Which when we visited most of the schools that I visited. Now the thing is changing. In the past six years, I've realized that some schools have become slightly closer, alhamdulillah, to the concept that I have. But most of the schools, they may be having maybe three periods a week on Islam, or maybe one period a day. Maximum I came across was two periods a day on Islam. And what was the main objective that a child, when he passes from school, he should have the knowledge of Quran, Hadith, Sharia, Fiqh, and science, etc. That I could not find. Though I visited the best of schools in America, in South Africa, which is supposed to be very much advanced in this field of Islamic schools, UK, Australia, Malaysia, etc. 
So that we thought that, let's make an effort. And with Allah's help, Alhamdulillah, we in Bombay, Alhamdulillah, about approximately six years back, or rather five and a half years back, we launched our own Islamic school by the name of Islamic International School. Because for my children, we had to do it. Though I was prepared to see to it that gear up my child, though putting in a convent school by giving all the so-called education at home, but then we thought that we should make a sample school. And alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah, we ventured with this project in Bombay, and Allah helped us, and with Allah's support, we launched the school. And alhamdulillah, from day one, the response that we received from the people of Bombay, from the Muslims of Bombay, was tremendous, mashallah. The response was such that though the school was absolutely new, we hardly publicized it. We decided to start the school. There was only three weeks publicity, mashallah. But immediately when the school was launched, the amount of response we got was phenomenal. And it was overwhelming that ministers, they phoned our school to see to it that some of the friends get admission to the school. It was good, mashallah. You will hardly find a minister phoning a madrasa and telling that, you know, I want a seat in your madrasa. We find that in the convent school. In India, most of the convent school, the ministers phone and they try and use the influence. But alhamdulillah, we are very strict as far as admission criteria is concerned. We are very strict with the guidelines. And unless a person fulfills our guidelines, let him be a minister, son also, we won't give admission, alhamdulillah. The difference that is there, that we appreciated that the movement that was started by many of the philanthropists and educationists throughout the world, it was a good movement, at least giving them an environment of Islam. So I was really happy that in the Western countries, whether it be USA, UK, there were schools in which a child could at least practice his Islam. When the school that we launched, we had a different system we had, that I wanted a striking balance that when a child passes the 10th standard, he should become at least an average alim when he passes from Darul Ulum, as well as be able to compete with the best of convent schools in that city. That was the aim. And with that target, we started the school. And we did many unconventional things, which people told it's not possible. But Alhamdulillah, with Allah's help, we did it. The timing of a school is quite long. It starts from 8 o'clock to 4.30. For nursery, it is less. We started school from nursery, from the age of three. And the first year, we had nursery, junior kg, senior kg, and first standard, only four classes, only four grades. And the timing from first onwards, first upwards, is from 8 o'clock to 4.30. And people said the timing is too long. Students won't be able to take it. But alhamdulillah, we divide the day into 12 periods, each of 35 minutes. On an average, two periods every day are for extracurricular activities. Martial arts, whether it be taekwondo, judo, swimming, whether it be computers, and all the extracurricular activities on an average two periods a day. Every child, it's compulsory, should learn swimming, taekwondo, judo, martial arts, for the boys, football, etc. And the balanced 10 periods, five periods are in English and five in Arabic. Our school has a dual minimum instruction, English and Arabic. Arabic is the language of the Quran. It's the language in which the last and final revelation was revealed. We realize I realized the drawback, that because our parents did not think it important that we should learn Arabic as a language, we know it's a drawback, even today. So we want to see to it that our children, our next generation, they should know Arabic as the mother tongue. So five periods are in Arabic, five are in English. But naturally, the five periods that are then Arabic, they're Islamic, whether it be Arabic language, whether it be Hivs, whether it be Talawat, whether it be Hadith, whether it be Quran, Tafsir, and all the Islamic studies that we have, when we give the Tafsir of the Quran, it's not in English or Urdu. Like back home in India, Pakistan, we have the Islamic studies in Urdu. In the Western countries, we either have in Urdu or we have in English. There, we have in Arabic, Arabic to Arabic. So the child, from the age of three, when he joins nursery school, he starts learning Arabic. When we teach him A for Allah, B for Bismillah, along with that, min alif asadun, min ba baitun, min ta tufahun, 
So from the age of three, the child is ingrained with the Arabic language. And in the Arabic period, the children cannot speak English, they should only speak Arabic. In the English period, only English, no Arabic. And most of Arabic teachers, they have gone to Saudi Arabia, and they've graduated from the Islamic University of Medina, so that even the pronunciation is correct. Besides the Arabic period that is there, the five periods in English, one period every day is Islamic studies in English. That's for Dawa. Because the child, when he does Dawa with the non-Muslim, it will be in English, he can't do in Arabic. There are very few Arab non-Muslims. So one period is Islamic studies in English. The balance four periods on average is maths, English, geography, history, science, etc. And though the period, if you analyze that five periods in English, is very less. But we have been able to achieve this because the ratio of our teacher to student is very low. In Bombay, on an average, on an average, in Bombay, one school, each class has 50 students. Some have got 60, some have got 70, some have got 80. The good schools have got 50, very few schools have less than 50. And for every two classes, there are average three teachers. That means each teacher, the ratio of teacher and student is about 30 to 35. Every 30 to 35 students have got one teacher in Bombay and in India. If you go in the villages, it is much higher. Every one teacher has got 50 students on average. And the international standard says that it should be 1 to 20. The good private schools in UK, USA, they have every teacher has got 10 students on average. The good private schools. We in Bombay, we have every five students, one teacher. Each class has got 20 students. On average, some have got 18, some have got 19. But at times, for example, when there are classes of HIVs, so in that class of 20 students, there will be five Qurras coming in, Qaris. So each batch will have about four students. So when we have certain classes, it breaks up so that the HIVs is better. The concentration is better, so the child can learn faster. In our school, HIVs is compulsory to standard three. To standard three, the child in nursery junior KG, he starts the Yassan al-Quran. He does the Nazar of the Quran in senior KG. Starts doing hifz in senior KG. On average, senior KG, he memorizes half Jews. First, second, and third, every year, one and a half Jews. So by the time the child completes standard three, he memorizes at least five Jews. Some may memorize six, some seven, some may even do four. After that, hifz is optional. Those people who feel have got a good memory, we select them, maybe 25%, one fourth to one third of the students, and we call them one hour 15 minutes earlier. So instead of coming at eight o'clock in the morning, from four standard, they come at cow to seven. Now, when the HIFS class in the morning is conducted after third standard, for one Kari, there are two students maximum. So the ratio of the Kari and the students in the higher classes is reduced. One Kari, one student, or one Kari, two students maximum. And only because he comes one hour 15 minutes, early in the morning, does his for one hour 10 minutes, in a year, on an average, that child memorizes five Jews. So by the time he completes the next five years, at the end of eight standard, he memorizes the complete Quran. <laughs> so, so far, mashallah, we are in the sixth standard. In the fifth standard, According to our normal course, the child should memorize 15 Jews. But many students, mashallah, at the end of fifth standard, have memorized 18 Jews, some 19, some even 20. So my son, who's now in the sixth, he's hardly 12 years old, mashallah, he knows more Quran than me. He knows 20 Jews. I don't know that much. I'm not Hafizul Quran. His Qurat is better than mine. He can understand Arabic better than me. He can understand the Quran directly. I can't. So we want every child in our school to be better than what I was when I was in school. And inshallah, minimum, minimum, every child in our school, minimum, is 100 times better than what I was when I was a child. We want every child in the school should be multiple times like me. I am not the target. I am not the aim. I am not the sample. 
We want them to be multiple times better. So what we could not get in our childhood. And with Allah's help, Alhamdulillah, whatever we achieved, we feel that if we educate our children in the right way, right from the childhood, inshallah, inshallah, you will find a change in the next generation. We always had a target that if we have to change the society, we do projects in the short term. We have short-term dawa courses in our foundation, Islam Research Foundation, which is a crash course for 40 days, where we train students from different parts of the world. We have international dawa training program for 40 days, where we select the best people, one from UK, one from USA, from Singapore, Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, etc. And we give them a comprehensive training course. But this schooling of 13 years is a full-fledged dawa training program, according to me. And in our school, mashallah, we see to it that when they are trained, not only do they learn about Quran and Islam, they have been told about Christianity, about Judaism, about Hinduism, about Buddhism. Inshallah, when a child passes school, he will be far superior than an average Christian what he has knowledge about Christianity, what the average Hindu has knowledge about Hinduism, what the average Jew has knowledge about Judaism. The main aim of the school is to make dies and see to it that they follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in our school, mashallah, though main two languages are English and Arabic, we also start Urdu from the fourth standard. Third standard is Hindi, fourth is Urdu, and fifth is the local language of the state, that is Marathi. These children, mashallah, they're trained in a way that they know the values of life. And we find that many a time, mashallah, these children, they put us to shame. They put us to shame. And many times when we go out, and the children, mashallah, they masoom. And that reminds me that once I had gone to meet a very big businessman, a top businessman in Bombay, very big businessman. And when I met him, I had my son with me. That time he was in the second standard. And the businessman was smoking. So my son said, uncle, smoking is haram. Finish. I would think 10 times. You know, Dua Madai, you know, to say directly, we have to you know, see for the situation and we see whether what is the right time, they should not feel hurt, etc. We'll think 10 times how to say, when to say, what to say. And the young child said, and the person put off his cigarette immediately. Easy. So, mashallah, we should see to it that we should have a vision of how do we want our children and what they should become. We have a concept that on average, when we have four divisions, if 100 students pass out, in a year from one school, 50% may go in the mainstream, may become doctors, engineers, lawyers. But when they become doctors, they'll be true Muslim doctors, having knowledge of Islam, true Muslim engineers, true Muslim businessmen. 50% may go in the Islamic field, may become Dai, Muhaddis, Mufassir, may take up teaching, Islamic teaching, Alhamdulillah. So in this way, can we change the next generation? We can't keep on cribbing about what's happening. We should make a beginning. And in this way, mashallah, the main success that I feel of the school is that our interviews are very strict. The interviews we conduct are so strict that the rules that we started, the rules are unheard of. We broke most of the conventional pattern. Normally, for the students, they have got three interviews, the child. And even the parents are interviewed, the father and the mother. They have to undergo two interviews of average of one and a half hour each. And the final interview is taken by me. And alhamdulillah, in the second year, we had 800 applications. 75 seats, 800 applications. So most of the years, we have 10 times more number of applications than the number of seats. And let me tell you, our school is one of the most expensive schools in Bombay. The fees is, we had the 25,000 rupees a month, which is very expensive. Average fees in Bombay is 100, 150 rupees. The good convent schools, they charge 1,000 rupees, 1,500 rupees. Ours is 25,000 rupees. That is 600 in US dollars. Though now there are other schools which are much expensive. But Islamic school, mashallah, so not that it is cheap. But yet, no poor person can say that I did not get admission because I did not have money. We have 25% scholarship quota. The 25% of the seats, even if the person does not pay a single rupee a month, he can get admission. But 25% of the seats have been reserved for poor children. So in our school, we have, mashallah, parents who are earning more than a crore rupee a month. 
they may be millionaires there are, they may be earning a million pounds they earn. There are some students whose parents earn 3,000 rupees. But when we give scholarship, we transfer that amount of fees into the current account. So when they get the money, they come and pay full fees to the cashier. So even the cashier does not know who's a scholarship child. It's only the management, me, my wife who's the principal, and a few others who know who are scholarship children. So even the teachers don't know who's a scholarship child. So we maintain that secrecy. So we transfer the money in the account, they come and pay full fees. So even the cashier does not know. So that we have a proper system and equality while teaching. When we have the formal education, mathematics, history, science, geography, we see to it that in this, when we teach, we incorporate 25% Islam in it. For example, when we teach science, we talk about the Big Bang Theory, that a few decades earlier, the scientists have discovered how did our universe come into existence. First, there was a primary nebula, then there was a secondary separation, which gave us to galaxies, the stars, the planets, and the earth on which we live. Then we say, this is mentioned in the Quran, 1400 years ago, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21. Verse number 30. Avalam yalal lazina kafiru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaan azrat kan fsakna huma. That the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clothed them asunder. Now this, what the scientists have discovered recently, the Quran mentions 1400 years ago about the Big Bang. So in this way, the child comes closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, he's being educated about science. We tell them. That the first person who described the blood circulation, it was Ibn Nafis. Later on, William Harvey made it famous to the Western world. We even teach them Darwin's theory. Unlike the other schools, I realize that in some Western countries, a child goes to the normal convent school, government school. In the evening, he goes to evening madrasas. So in the morning, he's taught that the human beings have been created from monkey. And the evening, he's told that the first man is Adam alayhi salam. In the morning, he's taught that riba is very good, interest, you can become a great businessman, wealthy person. In the evening, he's taught riba, interest is haram. So there's dichotomy. There'll be confusion in the mind of the children. That does not mean don't send your children to madrasa. Madrasa are doing good work, alhamdulillah. They should continue. Better send them than don't send. Don't get me wrong. The madrasa are very good, mashallah. I'm for it. I'm not against it. But we have to keep on improving the standards. So whatever doing, mashallah, they're doing a good work. When I go to madrasa, I tell them that you incorporate English there. You incorporate the formal subjects. So when there is a different teaching in the morning and the evening, the child is confused. So when we teach science, we see to it that we incorporate and tell them even Quranic verses related to that. Quran speaks about water cycle, about geography, salt and sweet water. Quran speaks about geology, that mountains have got roots, and many things which is not mentioned in the textbook. The teachers, they are trained. They're trained how to teach. And in this way, out of the normal formal education, 25% Islam is even incorporated when we teach the mathematics, science, history, geography, etc. We have taken the normal syllabus, IGCSE, following that syllabus and even incorporating the Islamic studies, both in Arabic and English. So that when the child appears, he appears for the normal examination. That is the central board examination. After he passes that, he can take up medicine, take up engineering, or become a lawyer, or a businessman, or come to the mainstream of Islamic studies, no problem. He has his choice. And what we are doing, that we are in contact, mashallah, with those people who are experts in the world, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, Fas alu ahal zikri in kuntum la talamun. That if you don't know, ask the person knowledgeable. So we are in touch with the knowledgeable people from different parts of the world. We are in touch with the local experts of Madinah University, of Umul Qura, etc. We are in touch. So that whatever thing that we want to put it into practice in our school, we consult with the experts, but we are doing many things which are unconventional. Many people told me, Rabbi Zakir, it's not possible. You can't have two streams at the same time. It's not possible. I tell them, at least make dua. At least make dua, inshallah. So what we want to do, we want to give a sample role model to the ummah that it's possible. Though many people, majority said it's not possible, but alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, if you meet the parents, 
And if you see the annual day CD of a program, then you'll come to know, alhamdulillah, that what is the level of education, mashallah. So as I was telling, the main thing is the interview. When we interview the parents, we are very strict. We are very careful that we see to it that the parents have the same thinking as the management. And we are very strict. In the first year, when we started the school, we had a clause, compulsory that the mothers should do hijab. More than 50% of the mothers in the first year of our school, they were not doing hijab. But within one month's time, mashallah, all of them had to do hijab. Now, when they want to admit their child, they do field work. Okay, if you want to get admission to Islamic International School, we have to do hijab. So before coming to the interview, they wear hijab. They're trained. Because they want admission in our school. So they do a survey. What is the requirement of the school? We have got, mashallah, millionaire parents who are businessmen, who are business tycoons. When they come for the interview, we ask them, how many times do you offer salah? So they tell us, Jummah ke Jummah. So we tell them, brother, then don't admit your child in this school. Go and put him in a convent school. He says, why? Because we will teach your child. It's mentioned in Sai Muslim. The difference between Iman and Kuf is Salah. Maybe your child after three, four years will call you a kafir. Therefore, don't put him in a school. Put them in a convent school. They said, no, we want admission here. We will offer Salah. We will offer five times Salah. Then they give it in writing. <laughs> so it's compulsory that... 100% of the parents, they give in writing that they will offer Salah five times. Believe me, we did not know that we could actually pressurize the parents or blackmail them. When the Christian missionaries are blackmailing our Muslim children, our Muslim parents in Bombay, they are paying 5,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds to get admission. And after paying that money as bribe, every day our children are doing shirk. They are saying, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God. So when the Christian missionaries can force them to do shirk, why can't we force to do something with this further? And believe me, we have been very successful. We know it is not allowed by this government and that government, but alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah. So, mashallah, even the multimillionaire, he waits for the interview, we tell him the interview will take time, be prepared at least four or five hours, and you will be interviewed for about one and a half to two hours. And mashallah, we have a big questionnaire. And we explain to them the concept of the school. And we tell them that the satellite television is a big shaitan. So the cable TV, satellite TV should not be in your house. TV is not haram. But the cable TV, the satellite TV is a big shaitan. And normally we find that we know that in the Western statistics, the average in America, a child sits in front of the TV for approximately seven hours on average. More time than he spends in school. Even in India, they spend several hours. And what happened, you know, when we say that if you want admission, you remove the cable TV. And mashallah, they have to do it, otherwise no admission. So because they want, they may not be practicing Muslims, but they have that jazba, they have the iman, they want to put in the school. And now it has become a status. Oh, my son got admission into IIS, status. Alhamdulillah. Allah has given us that status. So to get admission means it's the status. I got admission in Islamic International School. I passed the interview. So then... We realize that once the cable TV is out and it's compulsory that the parents, the mother should attend every week our Islamic lectures, compulsory, at least once. Father, twice a month, compulsory. If you don't have time, then no admission. So even the parents are being ingrained. It's a package. We are not only training the students, we have been trained the parents. We don't want that we train the child and after 13 years, the father says, okay, now go and do business. Okay, start giving bribe, etc." So we want to see to it, we don't want to pour water over drugs back. Chances are that 50% we will lose our children. Because finally the parents control them. So we even change the parents. And if we know that the business the parent is doing is not good, we'll tell you. There are some people who have got businesses. Maybe they're working in bank. I will tell them, working in bank is haram. Maybe your child, once after four or five years, he will cause you trouble. So see to it, you change your job fast. So knowingly very well. Yet they want to put their children in our school. And the point to be noted here is that after a few months, then the husband comes and tells us, you know my wife, she has stopped watching TV, now she gives me more time. So even the family life improves. We have got stipulated conditions before admission that minimum 20 minutes every day, there should be a family reading of the Quran along with translation. 
every day, compulsory. The father should attend twice a month our lectures in which we talk about Islam, the mothers once a week. So in this way, mashallah, even the environment becomes Islamic. Then beside the parents, even the other siblings come, even the grandparents come. So it is rather changing the society. And we found that when we visited the Western schools, I'd gone to South Africa, and I'd gone to one of the best schools in South Africa about six years back. I don't want to name the school. The principal of the school told me that, Brother Zakir, we are at the mercy of the parents. We have to force them to come and take admission, though our fees is half than the other private schools, but then they blackmail us. If you tell us too many things, then we'll go to the government school. We'll go to the white school. And he told me, our students in the 8th standard, 9th standard girls, one evening, we went to a hotel and we found our girls wearing mini skirts and shorts and dancing. Imagine, one of the best schools in South Africa. And the parents were called, the parents are blackmailing. If you get too strict, we'll take out our children from here. Here in our school, we blackmail the parents. But natural for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway, the school is not a business. So what fees we take, we are spending from our own pocket. So it's not a business. Please don't get me wrong. The school, IRF always does everything free. The school is the first thing we are charging money. But even those who are paying full fees, we are subsidizing the fees. So in this way, mashallah, we want to create a new society. And what we feel that most of the organization that start, it's a one-man show. After the person goes away, the whole thing goes down. Most of the Muslim organization you see, it's a one-man show. That person goes away, the organization falls down. So we see to it that we require backups. At present, mashallah, in a foundation, Islam Research Foundation, we have more than 15 speakers, mashallah, besides myself. And some of them travel in different parts of the world. They have been to UK, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, South Africa, several places, mashallah. And these children, mashallah, they are our future generation. And if you see the annual day that we have, in the annual day when we have skits, normally most of the other schools, they have fancy days where a person, maybe he may dress up like Michael Jackson or may dress up like maybe Sunil Gavaskar or whatever it is. Here, in our concert, mashallah, one person becomes, he imitates Sheikh Sudesh, one like Sheikh Ahmed Didad, you know, in this way, mashallah, we find that the role models of our children, the present age role models for our children, they are not these pop stars and pop singers and film actors. They are like Sheikh Sudesh, like Sheikh Ahmed Didad, Brother Bilal Phillips. So here we find that we should ingrain in our children that what should they become when they grow up. And mashallah, if you see that these children, they are taught public speaking right from junior kg. From the age of four, they are taught to stand in front of the microphone. And they are taught how to speak on the microphone. Most of our speakers, I'm sorry to say, they don't know public speaking techniques. What should be the distance from the mic? How is the modulation? How it should go up? How it should come down? The gestures, the eye to eye contact. See, when a person gives a speech on the stage, the matter he speaks carries only 7% marks. How much? 7%. 93% is presentation skills. How do you modulate? Your gestures, your eye-to-eye -eye contact. That's the reason today, actually I'm handicapped. The sound system is not good. It is like you're sending a warrior to a battlefield without weapons. We should be trained that how we should be able to dawah. The children, right from the age of four, they're trained public speaking in English as well as Arabic. So we want that a future generation that they should be trained, alhamdulillah. So this was a vision with which we started the school not knowing whether we will be successful or not. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been so much helpful and grateful that we got application from different parts of the world, from different cities in India. We have got application to start the school in Saudi Arabia, in UAE, in Yemen, in UK, in USA, several applications. So far, we have only started one more branch in Chennai. And our criteria are very strict, mashallah. So inshallah, we feel that every few years, we'll open one school so that it will be role model for the others. One thing we have to realize that for success, we have to follow the guidance of the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And always, we have to be professional. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, فَاسْأَلُوا أَحَالِ الزِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ 
If you don't know, ask the person who's knowledgeable. Ask the person who possesses the message. We as a policy in our organization, Islam Research Foundation, though we are a very small organization, it was started 15 years back. Alhamdulillah, we are only one employee. Now we have more than 400 employees, full-time paid employees. We always believe that we should be professional. And all the people that we employ, mashallah, we have a policy that whatever they're drawing in Bombay, if they join an organization, we give them more. We don't believe that if you're getting about 20,000 rupees, so come here for 50%, 10,000 rupees for last sake. If you're getting 20,000 rupees, we'll give you 25,000. If you're getting 30, we'll give you 35. If you're giving 50, we'll give you 60. But then you work, you strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want the parents phoning me up, the doctors asking, I gave an Islamic lecture, and now my son is earning half. If I give him more, even the parents are with me. Even in our school, Islamic International School, that as far as the teachers, we have got strict conditions even for the teachers. And initially, I'm a nightmare even for the parents. I'm a nightmare even for the teachers. We have so many rules and regulations. Someone called us the Al-Qaeda school. <laughs> Qaeda means we have too many rules and regulations. And our teachers, mashallah, on an average, we interviewed about two and a half thousand teachers and selected less than 25, or 0.1% the selection. Similarly, for our Qaris, the Qaris we selected, we interviewed in different parts of India, Lucknow, Nadwa, various parts, Surat, our crew went. And there too, we interviewed more than 4,000 Kurras. And now we have over 40 Qaris we have. So our selection procedure, it is very strict. Less than 1% of the people we interview, we take them as our staff. And once we take the staff, the staff, we pay them more than what they get outside. We give an open ad in the newspapers that if selected, we will pay you more than what you're drawing. The ad says like that. If selected in our school, we will pay you more than what you're drawing. Irrespective of what you're earning, in any convent school if you're teaching, we keep only Muslim teachers, mashallah. And here, the teachers, instead of coming for five days, they have to come six days a week. Five days to teach our children. Our school works from Monday to Thursday, and on Saturday, we have Friday and Sunday holidays, which was very difficult. Everyone objected initially that how is this unconventional Friday and Sunday? Nowhere do we have in the world. I said we have it in IIS. And mashallah, in the long run, it was beneficial. Now the children are fresh to study twice a week on Saturday and Monday. In the normal school, they are fresh only on Monday. Here they are fresh twice a week on Saturday as well as Monday. And in our school, we have got no homework. Whatever is taught, is taught in the school. If there are some children who take late admissions, and if they have missed on the Arabic, they have to come on Sundays. Extras from 8 to 1 every Sunday to catch up absolutely free. And our teachers, they come five days to teach from Monday to Thursday and Saturday. And on Friday, they come to be taught. We educate our educators in our school. Our teachers, they get training once a week. They have the best of professionals coming to train them. These professionals, they are very well qualified in the field. They may be psychologists, they may be psychiatrists, they may be child counselors, they may be nutritionists, top people, Indian foreigners, they may be people, top non-Muslims. We pay them through the noses. We have workshops on Fridays, and we train the teachers, even in voice and accent. The voice and accent training we give, we spend lakhs of rupees so that they have a neutral accent. And in Bombay Channel, in a non-Muslim news channel it came, the only school which has voice and accent from junior classes, IIS. So the specialized non-Muslim trainers come and train our teachers. They in turn train the students. So our teachers also, mashallah, they have to work hard. We pay them, but they work hard. And we are very strict with our rules, mashallah. And we believe in professionalism. So what happened that by the time they stay in our school, they get trained. Same thing with Akari, same thing with Arabic gen teachers, same thing with lady teachers. And unless we are professional in our field, we will not get the results. And if we see the annual day that we had, the annual day, and we have shown that annual day even on satellite channel, moment we showed on the satellite channel the annual day of our children performing, we got applications from different parts of the world that we too want to open a similar school. Now, just a few months back, 
We are another annual day, which the cassette has been released. It is 10 times better than the first one. And Alhamdulillah, there if you analyze, it was for five hours. And only the children performed. No adult, no teacher even spoke a word. All the children from nursery to standard five, they performed. And even they themselves were the compare. They compared the program professionally. MashaAllah, they were the compares. They handled everything. Not a single teacher even spoke a word. No one spoke. For five hours, without a break, the audience was glued to the seat. Glued. Five hours, imagine. Our children, from the age of three and a half to 11 and a half, they glued the audience for five hours, mashallah. And what we did, we did not spend a great deal of time. We hardly trained them for three to four weeks. That's it. And in the first week, it was two hours a day. Second week was three hours a day, then half a day. Last week was three-fourth a day. So they lost about two weeks of the school on an average, nine working days. But we saw to it that we got professionals. We had professional choreographers. What our Islamic step that we had taken. And when we had the show, we had a Dawa conference, an international Dawa conference, where our students, mashallah, as I mentioned earlier, the Dawa conference was started by the recitation of Sheikh Sudesh. So one of the students dressed up as Sheikh Sudesh. Then we had Dr. Israel Ahmed giving a speech in Urdu. Then we had Bilal Phillips coming. Then other speakers, Brother Abdul Rahim Green. Then there was a person like Sheikh Ahmed Didad. Then my son dressed up like Dr. Zakir Naik. The point to be noted was that we had professional people to do makeup from the film industry. And the person who had done, if you know about Amitabh Bachchan, who had done the beard for Amitabh Bachchan in Shane Shah, you know? Shane Shah, though we don't encourage people to see movies, but I was told that the person who did the beard for Amitabh Bachchan in Shane Shah, he was a Muslim, he happened to be my friend. So we had them, mashallah. And the makeup, if you see, I doubt you might have seen anywhere else that young children of the age of 10 years, 11 years, the way they performed. And my son, he copied the speech, five minute section of my speech which I gave in London last year. When I'd come in December for the Global Unity of Peace, the talk I gave at the Excel Theater. And mashallah, you see, same type of beard, same cap, same coat, the actions. So the teachers trained them. The gestures, the way they walk, the way they come to the mic, the way they adjust the microphone, everything. Similarly with all the other speakers. If the speaker sits and speak, our children also sat and spoke. And there were various skits. So if you see the drama, if you see the full five hours, you find children right from the age of three and a half to about nine and a half performing. And there was one section where a person is speaking the various languages we teach in our school. English, Arabic, Marathi, Hindi, Urdu. You could see in the skit that our children, mashallah, are so fluent in all these languages that really impresses the people. But one thing you realize that we should believe in professionalism. And if we see in our school, we have all types of Muslim taking admission. Hanafi, Shafi, Medalbi Salafi, Ahle Hadid, Jamaat Islami, Tablighi, Deobandi, Barevli. But we say, in our school, we follow Quran and Sunnah. And we take in writing that we will teach what is mentioned in Quran and Sai Hadith. And we make it very clear. We do not believe in dividing Muslims into different sects. Islam is against that, Quran is against that. Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 159, that if anyone makes sex in of Islam, it is haram. Oh, Prophet of Allah, we have nothing to do with him. So, in spite of this, we have the children of the heads of the different jamaats. Jamaat Islami, Tablighi, Jamaat, all wanting admission, mashallah. So, you really feel and you see a cross section of the Muslim ummah, the rich class, the middle class, the poor class, the different people, and people come from far away areas where they even have to travel two and a half hours. They come from length and breadth of Bombay. The school is in center of Bombay. People come from Mira Road, from Mumra. They travel two and a half hours up, two and a half hours down. And some of the parents, when the child is very young, they have to travel eight hours, two hours up and down to drop, two hours up and down to pick up. So here we find that once you give quality, people are bound to come to you. One thing is the Muslim Ummah wants Islamic education, but I, believe me, I would not put my son in any of the Muslim schools in Bombay if my school wasn't there. Not that I hate Muslims. I like them, but I want my child to get proper education. So the only option I had was to start a school. So here we realize that there should be demand. And whatever activity we do, we always say there should be 10 times 
minimum more number of people wanting to take part than the number of seats you have. Always. If there's a demand, then mashallah, you can provide quality and you can get the best out of the people because they know they have got admission out of a great difficulty. So what we say they follow. If you get easy, if it's a walkthrough, then they take it for granted. And to have this model somewhere else, there are many people who copied uh, all our syllabus is absolutely anyone can copy it free, no problem. But many people copied, hardly anyone came even close to 5% of what we are doing. Because the main thing is not the syllabus, main thing is the management. Copying the syllabus is very easy. You can't take a syllabus from a good American or British school and think you can match it. Main thing is how well you control it, how well you handle it. The management is very important. The management, the teachers, the parents, all put together. There should be a combination of everything. Everyone should have faith in each other. Then only will you really be able to make a difference. And once you have the confidence of the parents, inshallah, you can do wonders. So many a times we introduce many things, mashallah. Always there has been cooperation. So unless you don't have quality, you will not be able to achieve what you're opting for. And this is the principle of Islam too. That we believe in quality, anything we do. So inshallah, what we want, that our next generation that they should have that love with Allah's kalam. So mashallah, if the Arabic is strong, unlike us, if the Arabic is strong, they can understand the Quran directly, they can implement on the message, and they can educate the others. Keeping this in mind, mashallah, we started the school, and with Allah's help, alhamdulillah, we never imagined that we could achieve whatever we have achieved. It's basically Allah's help. Whatever we are doing in IRF, in Bombay, when we look back, we could not have dreamt of doing these things. And the best example is myself. During childhood, I used to stammer. And I was in a medical college. I could have thought of becoming the best doctor in my dream. In your dream, you can dream of anything. No one can stop you. But even in my dream, I could not have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people because I was a stammerer. If you had asked me, what is your name? My name is Da, 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 Kid. Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is help. What he has transformed in me. It's a miracle. Now I speak in front of tens and twenty thousand people, hundred thousand people. Largest audience I've addressed live is one million. Live, not on television, no, live. One million. And in India, mashallah, audience is always forty thousand, fifty thousand. And the way we manage on time, we have five hundred to one thousand volunteers. Our volunteers. And when we call a guest speaker, there you see that when Dr. Isar Ahmed was called, not a single volunteer even shook hands with Dr. Isar Ahmed. Not that they didn't like him. They are trained. They are trained that mujahid. They can't shift away from the duty. They have to do the duty. And then only will you get result. Everyone, we have got volunteers, doctors, engineers, mashallah, more than a thousand volunteers we have in Bombay. So whatever we do, we do professionally. That's the reason in our audiences, more than 25% are non-Muslims. More than 25%. When we have 40,000 audience, more than 10,000 are non-Muslim. More than what Muslims can gather here, we have non-Muslims there coming for our talks. Even on satellite, mashallah, there's a great percentage of non-Muslims watching our programs and they appreciate mashallah. So I would like to leave the throat open for the question and session. I would like to end this talk of educating the educators, which was the main theme of this conference. And I chose Harrow, though I'm giving talks on every venue, different talks. I don't believe in giving the same talk every time. So I chose this when you harrowed the main theme, educate the educators and harrow. And we leave the floor open for the question and session. I would like to end my talk with the question of the glorious Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse 81, where Allah says, وَقُلْ جَعَلْ حَقْ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ When truth is heard again, falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood, it's by its nature bound to perish. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ